Derivations in predicate logic build upon our derivation skills that we learned in sentential logic. So everything that we learned in that section applies here. We need to have our 10 basic rules, our 5 derived rules, we need to be comfortable with the distinction between elimination and introduction rules, and negation of rules as well. And really, we want to be very comfortable with our 5 steps to master for derivations. So what we need to add to our predicate logic system are basically rules for our quantifiers, because that's the main thing that's new to uh, predicate logic. So what we're looking to add then are going to be the elimination, introduction, and negation of rules for our quantifiers. In addition, we need to just sort of learn and be comfortable with how we tackle things like names and variable letters in predicate logic. The first concept that we want to become comfortable with in predicate logic is substitution. A substitution lets us move from a symbolic sentence to symbolic formula. So in this example, if I have for all alpha phi alpha, I can do a substitution and change alpha to beta. Now a couple things about the substitution. First, when you do a substitution, you drop the quantifier. The second thing is that beta is just some term, some singular term. And in fact, uh, it doesn't really matter what it is in this case. We'll talk about what it can be and can't be later on. But for now, a substitution is where when you replace a bound variable with a free one. And this concept is extremely important moving on. So our first rule that we're going to learn is universal instantiation. And the instantiation rules are our elimination rules. So universal instantiation is the elimination of the universal. And what it says is that we can basically go from a universal statement to a substitution of a universal statement. And this should make sense. If everything is a phi, then it doesn't really matter what I substitute for that variable, and I get phi of beta, where beta can be anything, because that's what a universal means. Now there's an important restriction to universal instantiation. It says that beta, the variable that you instantiate or substitute to, cannot be bound within uh, the original phi alpha. Now, we won't, we won't worry about this for now, but I will explain why this restriction work, uh, makes sense later. These restrictions don't often come up, but when they do, you need to know to avoid them. So let's look at some good UI examples. So here I have a for all x, fx, gx, and I want to know what I can instantiate to, what I can substitute the x to, so uh, that I've done a proper universal instantiation. So in the first example, I could actually instantiate to fx arrow gx, and this would be, say, premise 1 ui. Now what I've done here is I've substituted x for x. Now you might think I've done nothing, but in fact I've done something very important. In the first original premise, I have for all x fx arrow gx. And there, the letter x is somewhat meaningless. It's a bound variable to the quantifier. And remember when we symbolized, there's no difference between this and for all y, fx, arrow, gy, and for all z, fz, arrow, gz. It's not actually about the variable letter when you're bound. It's about what it's saying. It's saying all f's are g's. When I instantiate, I'm saying x is an f, and therefore x is a g. So here, because the letter is free, it's very different in terms of meaning. Another good UI would be to instantiate or substitute a Y for X, say, or you can substitute a name letter, A. It doesn't really matter so long as it's a nice singular term. Now, you should note that I made a slight notation change in the third example. I said UI slash A, which is just a sort of code for me to know that I've substituted A for the uh, variable associated with quantifier. Another important thing to note about the instantiation here is that all instantiation rules and substitutions will drop the quantifier of the main operator and at the same time it will instantiate all instances of the letter. So I, was, I had to replace all the instances of x with a, for example. Uh, here's another uh, su sentence we can look at for all x, fx, arrow, and then this big existential. And I've highlighted in blue all the x's bound to the main quantifier, uh, which is the universal. So a good UI example would be like this. I substitute z for x in this case, and every single instance of the x under the scope of the universal got changed to z. And here I did it with a different name letter, b. No problem. So bad UI examples are probably a little bit more illuminating in terms of how the rule works and doesn't work. So here's an example from the first type. Uh, I had it for all x, 
fx arrow gx, and I tried to ui and get fy arrow gy, and what I thought I was doing was I was doing a substitution of y for x. But we can see why this is wrong, because I have not substituted every single instance of x under the scope of my quantifier. In fact, I only substituted for the first one and left the second one, so this is not a proper universal instantiation. Uh, similarly over here, I tried to substitute a name letter, but I only did it for the second in a version of x and not both. And lastly, here, I did substitute something for both instances of x, but unfortunately I substituted two things, a, b. a is a name and b is a name, so I've actually tried to put two things into a predicate that can only have one. So I violated the condition that I can only substitute singular terms when I do a universal instantiation. Uh, what about this example? Well, again, in this example, I have uh, the x's all bounded under the scope of the universal x. So here, I tried to do a ui, but again, this is no good because I substituted z for x, but in fact, I only replaced the first two instances of x and not the last, so that's no good. In this one, I substituted b for x, and while I did substitute b for all the versions of x, under the quantifier, so all the bound instances of x, I also, in addition, substituted it for one of the y's. And that's cheating, that doesn't make any sense, so I did not get this universal instantiation right. In the last example, I'm trying to substitute y for x, uh, and in this case, I actually did substitute every single instance of x for y, and only the instances of x for y. So why is this one wrong? What's wrong? Well, it turns out that this is the violation of the restriction. I cannot instantiate to a letter that is bound to a different quantifier within my original scope. So here, y is bound to the existential within the original scope of the universal. So I can instantiate to anything I want to except for y. Okay, well, let's actually sort of look at this restriction a little closer and try and figure out why it makes sense. We'll also sort of try and uncover a little bit about what the universal instantiation just sort of means in general. So let's take a look at this sentence. For all x, fx, arrow, ey, bracket, hx, and gy. And if you look at my odd abbreviation scheme, it says f is a burrito, h is tasty, g is an electron. Okay, so what does this say? It says, for anything, if you're an f, then you're an h, and also there exists a y g y. So I know I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but what it's really saying is that all burritos are tasty, and it also has the side note, there are electrons, and that's fine. Now, a universal instantiation is saying that logically it must follow that if anything that's a burrito is tasty, you can substitute anything for that x, and it should also make sense. So what this is saying is if a is a burrito, then A is tasty, uh, and there are also electrons. So what's A? A is just one particular burrito, and that's fine. So universal instantiation is sort of intuitive, because if something is true for everything in the universe of discourse, it must be true for any, each particular thing in the universe of discourse, and that's why we can substitute to anything we want. But according to the restriction, there is one thing that I'm not allowed to substitute to, and that's y, because y is bound to a different quantifier under the original scope. So what's the matter with substituting for y? Well, let's take a look at what this means. If I substitute for y, then I get this very odd uh, condition, which says that y is a burrito, and therefore it's tasty, and there is also a tasty electron, this is a bit weird. I've actually somehow confused the meaning and gone too far, and somehow it's the electron that's tasty and not necessarily the burrito. Something went wrong here, and that's because I violated the restriction. So this is how the restriction sort of works, and this is also sort of like a lesson in how to sort of read and understand what universal instantiation is really doing. Now, with universal instantiation, we can actually finally show that the original problem argument is valid. So the original argument we looked at was all cats are evil, frisky is a cat, therefore frisky is evil. And now we have a predicate logic symbolization scheme for this, which is f, g, and little letter a for frisky, and we get the following argument. And the question is, is this argument valid? Well, with the UI, we can actually prove it. 
And a proof in predicate logic doesn't look different at all than a proof in sentential logic. We start off with our show line, and uh, we could do an assume ID if we wanted to, but I'm just going to not do it uh, and just move on. And what I'm going to do is I do a universal instantiation on premise 1. Now premise 1 says, if you're an F, then you're a G. Well, if that's true, well, it's surely true then that if A is an F, then A is a G. Well, once I have line 2, I can quickly do a modus ponens, get GA. That's exactly what I want, direct derivation, box, and close. So universal instantiation lets me take sentences that have a universal quantifier as the main connective and eliminate that universal quantifier. And that means that I can then go just to my regular sentential rules and do things like modus ponens and modus tollens. Our next rule that we're going to learn is existential instantiation. It is the second instantiation we're going to learn, and this is the existential elimination rule. So the idea behind this is also very straightforward. If I have there exists alpha phi alpha, I can then infer phi beta. So when you first look at it, this seems exactly like the universal instantiation rule, except surely it can't be. It must be different, because existential doesn't mean the exact same thing as a universal. A universal means that it's true for all things in the universe, so it doesn't matter what you plug in. But an existential doesn't mean that. If I say, there is a dog, that doesn't mean that Joe is a dog, as well as rock is a dog, as well as particle as a dog, as well as color is a dog. That just doesn't make sense. In fact, it's just saying something is a dog. But what? So the restriction here is what lets us do the instantiation, and the restriction invokes a very, very important concept of arbitrariness. When you do an existential instantiation, you do a substitution such that beta must be an arbitrary term that does not occur in any previous line or premise. We'll talk more about the arbitrariness soon, but just remember, you have to substitute any variable letter i through z, and it cannot appear anywhere in your proof prior to that substitution. Now, an arbitrary term is in sort of its most general form, just something that we know nothing about. It's supposed to be a term that we know no knowledge of, and we don't know anything about, no properties, anything. And so there's a weak condition for this, which is, well, it's just any term that is not free in an unboxed line. But it turns out that most texts actually like to pick a very strong condition for arbitrariness, especially with the existential instantiation rule. So for us, we will adopt a strong condition for arbitrariness, which is that you must existentially instantiate to a term that does not appear in any previous line or premise. So those are our two instantiation rules, our elimination rules for the universal and the existential. They're quite easy to use and to remember, but just here are some important tips for using them right. First, always instantiate every single term under the scope of the quantifier. Secondly, remember that you can only use the elimination rule when the quantifier is the main operator, just like all our other elimination rules. You really have to know your restrictions, in particular for the existential instantiation, you have to know how that works. The concept of arbitrariness is important, and again, we will cover it later in this video in more detail. But for now, just remember, you must do existential instantiation to something new, some variable that has not been mentioned anywhere in your proof, whereas you can UI to everything except for the one restriction. Now you might think then that universal instantiation is the easier rule to use. It just says you can UI to anything you want, so that's great, super easy. Whereas EI has this complicated restriction about picking something new and you need to be careful and arbitrary. Well that's actually not true. It turns out that uh, existential instantiation is the easier rule to use because you have more restrictions, there's less choice. In fact you can't even really think about it when you EI, you just have to pick something brand new. Which leads us to the golden rule for derivations in predicate logic. This is hands down the most important tip in predicate logic derivations, which is when you can, you always existentially instantiate first, and then you will universally instantiate to match. Your goal is to match UI to get something useful. Now I have here that there is one exception, which is a buried existential. That's sort of an advanced derivation technique, which we'll cover at the very end of this video. In this first derivation example, we'll be making use of the existential and universal instantiation rules. In general, we'll always want to EI first and then UI to match. And this is a nice simple example of how the rules work. So 
A proof in predicate logic starts in the exact same way. We start with our show line and we go ahead and break it down. Now, the breaking down of this show line is nothing special. It's not a conditional, so we just do an assume ID and we end up assuming ID to get for all x, not ax, and that is just aid. Uh, well, the question is from here, what do we do? We could use the universal instantiation rule on line two. Similarly, we could UI premise two and we could UI premise three. And we can instantiate to anything that we want so long as we don't violate any restrictions. So here I could change for all x not ax and say, well, if not ax is true for everything, then I can make it true for a of b, for example. Um, but I don't really want to do that because I'm not sure what to instantiate to. So because of that, I follow the golden rule and I will existentially instantiate first. So the existential instantiation here says that I will instantially instantiate every single instance of x and replace it with a brand new variable letter that I've never seen before in the proof, and I will start with i. So I get fi or not gi, and that is premise one existential instantiation. So again, notice I peeled away the quantifier and I replace every instance of that bound variable with i. Well now, I actually know what to do. Uh, I realize over here, I have for all z, g, z. Now what I want to do is I want to modus to lend opponents this. This is just a regular sentential logic move. So to do that, I would need the negation of one side. So if I had g, i, then I could double negate it and do an MTP. But I can get that from premise three, because this says everything is a g, so that surely must mean that uh, i is a g as well. So that's premise three, u, i. Now I can double negate it, modus to lend opponents, and get fi. So that's four, double negate, and then with three, I mtp. And this is just standard um, sentential logic. Now I'm going to pause here and point out that if I had actually instantiated this to, say, g uh, a, because I'd done it earlier, I could not then mtp because I need these to be an exact match. GA or not not GA is not the negation of one side here. They need to match in every single part of the predicate and the slots. Okay, so now I have FI. I know what to do now. I'm going to match this with FI, and that will allow me to use modus ponens. So I go like so. That's premise 2 UI, and I can use this notation to I. And then now I can see I have a straight Oops, I made a mistake here. Uh, this needs to be i as well. So now I can do a straight modus ponens and get ai. And that's five, six modus ponens. Now I'm almost done. Now I just need to match my last thing and looking for a contradiction. On line two, this says everything is not an a, and this says i is an a. So of course I can ui line two and then this is my contradiction. So I have seven, eight, ID, because they are exact opposite of each other, box and close. So in this type of derivation, I use my existential and universal instantiation rules. I did a lot of matching, but you can see that once I match and peel away the quantifiers, everything basically follows sentential logic derivation. So there's no real new tricks here. Now we just need to add the introduction rules for our quantifiers. The first one we're going to do is the introduction rule for the existential. So let's take a look at the sentence. The raptor is purple and agile. How could we generalize this sentence? How could we sort of add an existential statement and infer an existential statement from the raptor is purple and agile? Well, we just need to sort of think what sort of naturally follows uh, from such a sentence. If it's true that the raptor is purple and agile, then it's certainly true that something is purple and agile. And this is sort of the type of generalization that we're looking to do. But it turns out other things are true as well. It's also true that something is purple and that the raptor is agile, or it's true that the raptor is purple and something is agile, and so on. So it turns out that there's actually lots of different ways we can generalize from a sentence like this. And this is what the existential generalization rule lets us do. So EG is a pretty straightforward rule, but it's got a couple restrictions, it's got a couple sort of annoying things about it that we need to go over in detail. So here it says, if I have phi beta, then I can immediately generalize to an existential sentence. That is to say, I can introduce 
the existential as the main logical operator. And so from phi beta, I can conclude phi al uh, there exists alpha phi alpha. Of course, there are some restrictions about what alpha can be. Restriction one says alpha cannot be bound variable within phi beta. The first restriction is actually the exact same restriction we looked at when we were looking at universal instantiation. It's just to say that we can't make a mistake of trying to capture too much uh, when we generalize. The second restriction says if alpha is different from beta, then alpha cannot be free within phi beta. This is a very odd restriction that doesn't come up too often, but I'll show an example soon about what each of these restrictions actually looks like in practice. If I have the statement fa and ga, and I want to do an existential generalization, how many different ways can I do it? Well, surely the first way makes sense. If I know that atom is an f and atom is a g, then it logically follows that there is something that is an f and a g. And that should just sort of sound perfectly good and happy. Now, over here, I could generalize it differently to a y. The point is, I can pick whichever variable I want to generalize to. It doesn't have to be x, y, it can be something of my choosing. Here, I can generalize the first a to x. Now, remember, when we did our instantiation rules, this a move like this would have been incorrect. Whenever you do an instantiation rule, you must instantiate every single instance of the variable to your new instantiated letter. But in this case, when we do a generalization, we don't have to. So the existential generalization rule lets us generalize a, 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 a sort of a subset of the variables that are under the original uh, set of sentence. So here, what I've done is I've generalized the first a to x and only the first a, and that's OK. Because surely, if f a and g a is true, then there is definitely something that's an f, and a is still a g, and that makes sense. Similarly, I can generalize uh, the a under the g and not the first one, and that shouldn't be a problem either. Now the weirdest generalization is actually this last one, which says I can go from fa and ga to the claim that there exists an x, fa and ga. And it seems like I haven't really done anything, but actually I have. I've gone from the statement uh, atom is an f and atom is a g to the statement there is something Oh, and atom is an f and atom is a g. Well, how do I know there's something? Because for atom to be an f, there must be something to be an f. And so this is sort of like a very odd generalization, but it does come in handy every so often. Here are some bad existential generalization examples. In the first one, I have f a and for all x, h a arrow g x. Now there's nothing wrong with that sentence, but then I try and generalize. And what I do, when you generalize, you make the existential, the new main operator. So I throw up the generalization, I put up my brackets, but what I've done here is I've actually tried to generalize to the letter x. So you can see I have there exists an x. So what I tried to do is change all instances of the a to x. Now that looks okay, except the problem is I violated the first restriction, which is I cannot generalize to a variable letter that is bound to a different quantifier in the same scope. This is just the exact same restriction that we looked at under universal instantiation. Here's another bad existential generalization example. If I have the statement fx and gy, well then I try and move to there is a y, fy, and gy. And now you can see why this is no good. Because in my generalization, I've sort of implied that these two are the same, that y is an f and a g. But I can't actually claim that from my original statement that x is an f and y is a g. Could be that n there's never the case where there's something that's both. And so this is actually no good. I violated the second restriction that says if alpha is different from beta, then alpha cannot be free within phi beta. These restrictions are a little odd, but they sort of just should make intuitive sense. You cannot capture too much or too little information when you do a generalization or an instantiation. And the classic way of doing that is by confusing and mixing variables up within your sentence. Now, using EG is pretty straightforward. You just introduce the existential as the main operator, and then you generalize whichever instances of the variables you like. Uh, but where EG actually is really helpful is in proof structure. Often we'll be asked to show something that is actually an existential statement itself. So here, for example, I have to show there exists alpha phi alpha. Now, what I would do normally, I guess, would be to invoke an assume ID and start a reductio. But actually, I can be smarter than that using proof structure. Uh, 
What I realize is that if I want to show that there exists an alpha phi alpha, I just need to show some sort of instance of that. I need to show some substitution of that, like phi beta. And then from phi beta, I will be able to introduce the existential as the main logical operator. Uh, so in general, uh, this is a really nice sort of a technique, and you really want to be aware that you're looking just for an instance of an existential as opposed to the uh, sort of actual existential statement itself. In this derivation example, we'll be talking about an existential. Now, the existential is quite easy when we have to generalize to it uh, because we can just invoke a bit of proof structure. This proof actually solves quite directly, so we don't really need proof structure, but I sort of want to show you how the reasoning works because uh, in more sophisticated derivations, this type of reasoning is really important. So if I want to show this, that means I need some instantiation of LZ or JZ. So I can sort of code this on the side by saying I need L alpha or J alpha. Now it doesn't really m matter what alpha is so long as they're the same. The reason why I need this is because then I'll just be able to existentially generalize alpha to Z and that will complete the proof. So now I just actually have to invoke old sentential style structure. If I want an OR statement, I just really need one of them. So I look at my proof premises real quick and I realize that J doesn't appear anywhere. So what I'm really looking for is L alpha and then I'll be able to move up to this line using my addition rule and then I'll existentially generalize to get what I want. So that is the structure of my derivation. I am on the hunt for L alpha, where alpha is anything. I just need some instantiation of L, and then I can generalize back to what I want. Now, I'm not going to bother with the assume ID. The reason why is we don't have a quantifier negation. I just don't want to get distracted by it. Let's just move on. So in terms of automatic moves, everything is bound by a uh, quantifier. So the golden rule says I should existentially instantiate first, that is premise 1 EI, and then I'll UI to match. And once I do this, I'll be able to just use my um, sentential skills. Now the, e, the UI to match here is pretty obvious. What I'm going to do is match the F predicates. So I get premise 2 UI to I, and I get GI arrow FI. And this immediately opens up a modus tollens. So that is 2, 3, MT. Now, now that I have the not GI, I could ask, hey, well, should I pin this to I? Actually, I don't really sh have any guidance on this yet because I don't have L or H fixed anywhere. But this one is pretty clear. I do have a G that is bound to universal. It can be changed to anything. So I want to match. So I will match that to this. And I get not HI and not GI. I changed all the X's to I's and I dropped the quantifier. So that's premise 3 um, UI. Now if I look at this line, according to what I know, this is a contradiction generator. So I really need HI and not GI. Well, I have not GI here already, so to build this contradiction, I just need HI. Uh, okay, let's take a look here. I can now UI and I get LI or HI. And that is um, premise for UI. So at this point, I just need to think about what I actually need. Now, I could just try and show HI directly, and it's, it's going to be sort of a bit difficult. But this is where the proof structure actually really helps us. Here's my clue. I originally needed an L alpha. But the thing is, I couldn't just start with show L of something, because if I would guessed wrong, it wouldn't have worked. And in fact, it's impossible to guess correctly because I would have needed to EI first. So now that I've done all my automatic moves, I can invoke proof structure and say, hey, what I really want to do is show LI because now I know that this alpha is really I. I do an assume ID and then I can immediately MTP to get HI and that's 6, 8, MTP and we're off to the races using our sentential logic skills. HI and not GI, and that is 4, 8, adjoin. And then finally on line 11, I can just repeat this, HI and not GI, and say that is line 5, repeat, because I need my closing conditions all in the same subderivation. And with line 10, that's an ID. Now, 
all that shows me li. Now I just need to go back up and reverse my proof structure analysis. And I can say, if I have li, I also have li or gi. And that is line seven add. And then if I have this, I can existentially generalize. If I know is i is an l or j, I know that there is something, let's call it z, such that that z is an l or that z is a j. And that is line 12, existential generalization. And that's a direct derivation. So this is how you do a proof using existential generalization when you actually need to show an existential. So this is how we use proof structure and we delay putting in the show line until we actually know what it is that we need to show.